for those of you that have just joined us, uh, just give us a few minutes. We're just waiting for everybody to come in. So sit back and we'll start in a minute. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks for everybody for joining us tonight on this wonderful evening here in Ohio. Uh, my name is Derek. I'm one of the reference librarians here at the Hudson Library. Just a couple little announcements and then we'll introduce tonight's author. We have two programs you may find interesting. We have on Thursday, October 14th at 7 p.m., we have the retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman. And he's the author of Here, Right Matters, an American Story. So he'll be joining us on October 14th, 7 p.m. via Zoom. Another author you might find interesting, you may have heard of him, James Patterson. He's gonna join us on Tuesday, October 19th at 7 p.m. And he's gonna be talking about his latest book, ER Nurses. So if you wanna sign up for those or find some wonderful programming that we're gonna have via Zoom, go to hudsonlibrary.org. And we'd like to thank the Learned Al for providing copies of this book here tonight. So on the right hand side in the chat window, we'll have a link to provide copies of this book that you could purchase. And at the very bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A as well as a chat feature over here on the right. So if you want to ask some questions to our author, go ahead and feel free to put some in the Q&A. We'll have plenty of time afterwards. So speaking of our author, tonight we have this Ruth Skur, and she'll be discussing her latest book, Napoleon, A Life Told in Gardens, this one here. So she was born in London and was educated in St. Bernard's Convent. And she was also uh, educated at Oxford University, Cambridge University, and Ecole Normale Supérieure. Not very good at French. Hopefully I got that correct. Uh, <laughs> currently, she teaches history and politics at Cambridge University in the United Kingdom. And she began her writing career in 1997 by reviewing regularly for the Times and the Times Literary Supplement. She's also written for numerous things, such as the New York Review of Books, The Nation, New York Observer, The Guardian, and The Spectator, and also The Wall Street Junior. She is also the author of two books, The Fatal Purity, Robespierre, and The French Revolution, as well as Sean Albury, My Own Life. And she's coming to us live from London, so I'll turn it over. Thanks so much, Derek, and thank you to everyone who's joining me. Um, it's pretty close to the middle of the night here in the UK, but I'm, I hope I'm going to be um, alert enough to, to answer any questions you have um, at the end of my talk. So this year um, is the 200th anniversary of the Emperor Napoleon's death on the South Atlantic island of St. Helena. And what I want to do in my talk tonight is to evoke the trajectory of his extraordinary life by talking about some of the gardens that he passed through and the shadows that he cast within them. But first I want to explain why I'm taking such an unusual and some might even say surreal um, approach to the life of one of the most important historical figures there has ever been. So as you see here, I'm illustrating this first part of my talk with René Marguerite's plaster copy of the Emperor's death mask, which was overpainted by the artist with sky and clouds. And this is the, the Tate's copy. And as you see, it, it has the, the, the title, The Future of Statues. And one of the things that's very important to me in the approach that I've taken in this book is thinking about alternative ways to tell the story of a great man's life and trying to project that life onto the natural world. So this image of the death mask with the clouds and the sky was one that was very important to me even before I started writing the book. 
So Napoleon was born in Ajaccio on the island of Corsica on the 15th of August, 1769. He became emperor of the French in 1804, abdicated a decade later. In 1815, he escaped from a brief exile on the island of Elba, reclaimed his empire for almost 100 days, lost the Battle of Waterloo and was sent sent to St. Helena, where he died on the 5th of May, 1821. So at the very beginning and the very end of his extraordinary life, gardening offered Napoleon a retreat from the frustrations of powerlessness. He was a clever Corsican boy who won a scholarship to a military school in France, and he spoke French slowly with a heavy accent. So whilst he was at school, he wanted sometimes to shut himself off from his peers, read, think, and remember his home and his family on the island of Corsica. He was powerless in the ordinary sense, a child from a secure but modest background with an unknown future ahead of him. And one of the pastimes he had at school, we're told in anecdotes from those who remember him, was to garden a very small patch of soil that was given to him, like an allotment uh, given to all the boys. And there was a story which has obviously been embellished by legend afterwards, that he took such pleasure in his little patch of garden at school that he started to take over the gardens on either side of, of his, expanding even then, that the, the, the reports looking backwards onto his life say, always ready to sort of expand his, his domain. Now, after he was sent into exile on St. Helena at the age of 46, gardening once again became Napoleon's last burst of activity just before he died. Um, on the advice of his doctor, he made a very elaborate garden on St. Helena, where sunken paths helped him to avoid the surveillance of the British guards. And he swapped that iconic beacon hat that is so famously associated with him for a battered straw one and set about cultivating the only patch of ground remaining to him. And it seemed to me that the interactions he had with the natural world right at the end of his life resonate with those of every man or woman who enjoys gardening in retirement or in retreat from the stresses and strains of the world. But obviously Napoleon was no every man. Earlier in his life, his relationship with nature was determined by his ambition. First to advance himself within the chaos and the aftermath of the French Revolution, and then to become the most important and feared man in Europe. And even when he was in exile, when he only had that one remaining patch of, of ground left to him, there were still echoes of grandeur and ambition in the extensive and meticulous plans he laid out for his last garden. So those periods of time, the school and the exile in St. Helena, they seemed to me to be like bookends of Napoleon's life. And they were the periods during which he had little control over the conditions of his everyday life. And he found a kind of refuge in growing plants. But in between that first and the last garden, the arc of his life rose towards the sky before falling back down to earth. And as his power grew, then declined, he rarely had time for gardening himself, but he passed through many gardens, large and small, public parks, private green spaces, admiring them. And very often he ordered improvements commanding other people's labor, always imagining a grander garden than the one that existed. He was a garden watcher and enthusiast. He was alert to the science and art of cultivation. He valued gardens as places to walk in at his own pace 
as he reflected on the frenetic events by which he hoped to secure the future of France. So for someone who was almost always in motion, in a hurry, more often at war than not, gardens offered rare opportunities for calm and pleasure. They were a counterpoint to the many battlefields, discrete settings in which the ground, the terrain and the weather were just as important as they were in combat, but for creative, not destructive purposes. So that contrast between the garden and the battlefield is also very important to me in writing the book. Um, I Just before I start going through some of the individual gardens that I have um, highlighted as, as significant in, in his life, I just want to say a word about shadows. Um, so a shadow, as we all know, is a dark area or shape projected by a body coming between rays of light and a surface. Now, in his life, Napoleon was often compared to the sun, um, as indeed the sun king, Louis XIV, had been before him. And Napoleon's first wife, Josephine, adopted the heliotrope as her emblem. And she had the motto, vers le soleil, towards the sun. But one of the ambitions for my book was to insist that actually Napoleon is not the sun. He actually was firmly situated within the natural world. And we can see him by tracing the shadows that he cast over other people's lives, those lives that were gathered around his. So I finally just want to make a contrast, another contrast between the idea of the shadow and the idea of the silhouette, because shadows are various. They are, there are very many different kinds of shadow that can fall um, ac across a particular garden, across a particular life gathered around Napoleon's. But his silhouette is singular, it's monolithic, it's instantly recognisable, it's probably the most recognisable silhouette there has ever been with the famous beacon hat again. Um, and during the bicentenary celebrations, I was very struck by the way in which we still fall back into very simplistic ways of talking about Napoleon, either as a good influence or a bad influence. And often events, celebratory events, would descend really into two teams, those who are for him, those who are against him. And my book tries to accept that there are many, many different ways in which we can approach Napoleon's legacy, that the shadows that he cast in his lifetime, that he continues to cast across history and our interpretation of history are various and plural. So I'm going to turn now to the first of the gardens, now, you remember me saying about the contrast between the garden and the battlefield. Well, in fact, my first garden that I want to highlight um, is one that became a battlefield. This is the, the Tuileries Garden at the center of Paris, just uh, very close to the Louvre, for those of you who, who have, have been there. Um, and it was in this garden that the, the final collapse of the French monarchy took place on the 10th of August, 1792. And as though one were writing a novel, it, it just happened to be the case that Napoleon, the young Napoleon, the young Republican soldier Napoleon was there to see the collapse of the monarchy. And later in his life, he told his brother Joseph that the carnage that he saw in the garden that day affected him more profoundly than any that he subsequently saw on the battlefields. It's a very dramatic claim by him because obviously he saw immense loss of life, bloodshed, the horrors of war. But in this garden, he thought with retrospect that actually 
it might have been because it was the first time he was seeing bloodshed um, very close up. It could have been the smallness of the space within which around 700 of the king's Swiss guard were, were murdered after they had been ordered to return to their barracks and set down their arms. The, the king had, had told them not to, to fire on the people. Um, so Napoleon, when he reflected on this, couldn't really decide if, if it was just that he was still so young and inexperienced of war and he saw that bloodshed, or even if it was the contrast between the formal garden and its beauty and all the carnage that took place there. Um, and he was trying to explain to himself why it had made such a lasting impression. And he remembered walking through the garden in the aftermath of the bloodshed and seeing well-dressed women behaving with gross indecency, mutilating the genitals of the murdered guards and seemingly civilized people descending into bestial behavior. And afterwards, when he went around the nearby cafes, he noticed anger in people's faces and he sensed revolutionary rage in every heart. And he thought that he caught people looking at him with hostility and defiance as though he was somehow suspicious for remaining calm, not sharing their anger. I think it was more likely he was simply in shock and very unsure of his future or what to think in the middle of the bloody revolution. But the sense that the crowd might turn on him just as suddenly as it had turned on the king never left him. In fact, it only got stronger and more plausible over time. So I'm turning now to a second uh, Parisian garden, which was also extremely important in the revolution. This is the Jardin des Plantes, the botanical garden, um, right uh, on, on the left bank in, in Paris. And um, this garden had existed well before the revolution. It was the King's Garden. Um, it had originally uh, been established by Louis XIII's doctors as a medicinal garden. Now, um, Napoleon was introduced to it uh, through his friend, uh, Jean Andos Junot, who had become his aide de camp during the siege of Toulon in late 1793. So Toulon is considered the, the very beginning really of Napoleon's military genius, the first sign that he really was going to have a very, very uh, distinguished and, and, and important career as a soldier. And um, this friend who he met at Toulon um, had an uncle, um, who the Bishop of Metz, who was a distinguished naturalist. And when Junot and Bonaparte, Napoleon, as he later was known, were in Paris together, they went for walks in this garden. And the, Napoleon loved to go on tours of the greenhouses um, and he was extremely interested already in the science of propagation, um, in, the, in the plants and that side of the botanical research that had been going on in this garden and had actually been rescued during the revolution. Many of the um, pre-existing royal institutions were shut down or closed, but the gardeners in, in the Jardin du Plant were very clever about reinventing that space and aligning it with the enlightenment and the revolutionary project. Um, so I'm going to, there's just one thing I want to, to emphasize here before moving on, um, which is the uh, connection really between this garden and the first Italian campaign, um, where Napoleon gets involved in sending back samples of plants um, to the garden. And 
one way we might think of that is as a form of plunder. It's like the art that was stolen from the cities in Italy that were invaded. So um, Rome and, and Venice and uh, many other parts of Italy where Napoleon demanded uh, a ransom of, of the art. And you might think of um, the parallel project of sending back plants and um, samples of, of animals as, 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 as well um, as a similar form of plunder, except insofar as obviously with a work of art, there's just one. And if you remove it, you, you, you deprive the country um, that you've invaded of, of what rightfully belongs there. Not so really with the plants and the animal specimens. Um, there was perhaps a, a more of a case to be made for scientific exploration. Now, this um, theme, which was uh, ex extremely important to Napoleon, um, became even more so during the invasion of Egypt. Um, I'm going to show you the garden at the heart of Cairo and then come back to this slide. Um, this is the garden of the Institute that Napoleon took the members of the, the scientists, the botanists, the artists um, with him to uh, Egypt and established the Institute in the, in the centre of Cairo. And here you see the garden and here going back is an illustration of the Institute of those savant or scientists um, and uh, scholars that Napoleon had persuaded to accompany him to Egypt. You see him here at the, at the very centre already with that uh, very distinctive representation in the, in, in the beacon hat. And you can also see the artist in the window seat um, wearing glasses. He's drawn himself in to, into the drawing. Now, what was important about um, the, uh, you know, Napoleon's lifelong interest really in science is that he was so um, deeply proud of his election to the National Institute in, in Paris. Um, and he boasted that he was providing Paris with a remarkable spectacle. So he was the young general of the army of Italy, um, but he was in the ranks of the Institute discussing profound matters in public with his colleagues. And that was what he was determined to try and establish in Egypt. So he appropriated palaces um, while he was there, um, confiscating things, uh, existing gardens off, off the Egyptians, and sometimes being extremely critical of, of what he found. So he wanted to graft French features onto those existing gardens. He, he complained that um, all, they were sort of laid out more like plantations rather than the formal gardens in, in the French style um, and that they didn't have alleys and, and walkways. So he starts to, to think about how those can be integrated. Um, we also have reports from the other scientists who, who are traveling with him, um, writing back and saying that this garden in Egypt is going to rival the one in Paris, um, that they're very excited by, it, by how luscious it is when it's watered by the Nile, etc. And almost describing it as a sort of one of the, the highest achievements in, in the Enlightenment um, to have it there. But what we also have to notice is how condescending they are, the, the French are, towards the Egyptian style of gardening. So the, um, the cartographer Jean-Marc, for example, he records that there were um, about 22 important Egyptian gardens in the city, but that we shouldn't think of those as being gardens in the European sense. They are dense with shrubs and vines. Um, they ha have, you know, orange and, and citrus, lemon trees, acacias, sycamores, 
and he echoes Napoleon's complaint that those gardens had not been designed for walking in, but more for enjoying from a seat um, inside a, a trellis covered kiosk. So now we return to, to France. Um, whilst Napoleon was away, uh, his wife Josephine purchased Malmaison uh, just outside Paris and was determined to make what already existed um, as, as a garden into something even more splendid than it had been before the revolution. Um, now, they had been to visit, Napoleon and Josephine had visited Malmaison before he left for Egypt. And he had decided that this house was too expensive. Um, throughout his life, he's incredibly fastidious about accounts. And it's only the fact that he's away in Egypt that Josephine is able to go ahead and purchase the house. And she just says, don't worry, you know, my husband will, will pay for it when, when he returns. And the garden of this house, the reason why she wanted it so much, had been laid out in what was known as the English style of gardening. Um, so instead of the French classical straight lines, topiary, um, avenues of, of trees, which actually Napoleon really favoured, um, the English style was much, uh, it was has winding paths, it has grottos, it has follies. It's a picturesque style of gardening. And over time, he becomes extremely frustrated um, with Josephine for the amount of money that is being spent on, on, this, on this garden. Um, it's important here to notice that um, Josephine actually is not a sort of frivolous, spendthrift in regard to the garden. She actually was a very serious botanist, um, very, very interested in propagating um, rare plants in seeing how they may or may not be able to be introduced into, into France. And that aspect of, of her interest was also one that Napoleon shared. He, he was very sympathetic to that. And there are often letters from him ordering that samples, plant samples should be delivered to Josephine, um, shared between her and the Jardin de Plantes, the botanical garden that I was showing you earlier. And there's also reports of even during the blockades, even during the, the war when it was very, very difficult for um, there to be any passage between uh, between England and, and, and France or, or other parts of, of Europe, um, an exception was made for ships that are bringing these plant samples. So it's, a, it's central and a, and a serious preoccupation, as well as being one that gives us insights into their personality differences and, and their difference in taste. Now, the next uh, image I want to show you is actually um, a cartoon that plays on this garden idea um, to show you the, the political resonance of it, really. So um, by 1802, um, Britain was France's only unvanquished enemy. And the two countries had been at war for almost a decade since the execution of Louis XVI following the fall of the monarchy, which I began the talk by describing. So finally, um, there was peace between a very brief, not lasting peace, but there was peace between, <coughs> excuse me, let me just, <laughs> between Britain and France. It was signed on the 25th of March, 1802, and it was ended on the 18th of May, 1803. But during that very brief period, Britain could afford to ridicule and dismiss the threat of Bonaparte. So what we have here is a, a cartoon um, from 1803 published by uh, Samuel Fores, a uh, satirical print, and um, it's called The Rival Gardeners. 
And so what we have um, on the left here, George III and on the right Bonaparte in their respective gardens on opposite sides of the channel. And they're each trying to grow a crown in the tub hooped with gold. And so you see George III, who also, by the way, had a very deep interest in gardening, gardening at Kew, hugely important to his family, and was nicknamed Gardener George. So you see the British portraying him here, but very comfortable in his gardening apron, um, in his gardening clothes, very confident. His crown is doing very well on top of this flourishing oak. Meanwhile, on the other side, even though Napoleon has put a gardening apron and, and gardening sleeves over his military dress, he is failing his, to grow his crown. Um, the, uh, the crown is, is, is not thriving, the plant is, is wilting. And he's saying there, you know, in, in, in the caption above his head, I, I don't know what the reason is. Um, my poppies are flourishing. You see them in the background in their pots, but but I, this this growing this this crown um, is it's a very delicate kind of plant, and I I don't seem to be able to rear it. I was really interested to discover this because I had previously thought that the uh, association between bloodshed and battlefields and the poppy was dated to the the First World War. But this seems to, to show that actually the association goes far deeper back in, in time than that. And those poppies are reflecting the bloodshed that there has already been by the time we reach this, this piece of, of Amiens, which, which didn't actually last. Um, now, I want to talk now about the imagined gardens. Um, and I'm showing you this image. Uh, again, we're back at the center of Paris. And here we have the um, Napoleon's architects, Persier and Fontaine's design for the Arc de Carousel, uh, which exists, um, many of you I'm sure will have, have seen it, um, between the Tuileries Garden I was describing earlier and, and the Louvre. Now, what Napoleon envisaged for that space was a huge garden at the center of Paris. And what he wanted to build there was a kind of new forum that would rival that of ancient Rome. And there had been for many years talk of collect, uh, connecting the, the Louvre and, and the Tuileries Palace to make a larger centre of government. And so this triumphal arch um, uh, and also the, the construction of the Rue Rivoli, which runs alongside it. They're the beginnings of a, a plan to actually establish a huge garden at the center of Paris. And it's been very interesting for me recently to see the way in which um, there are movements now, contemporary movements, to make greener spaces again at the center of, of Paris. Um, it's exactly what Napoleon was in, envisaging. But for him, there was inspiration from ancient Rome. Um, so you see uh, here that um, the, the arch that has been modeled on the arches of Septimus Severus and Constantine in the Roman Forum, Napoleon never got to Rome, but he did think of it as potentially becoming the second city of his empire. And huge plans were put in place to change that Roman forum space again into another very large garden. Um, they basically were thinking in terms of parallel gardens. So the uh, Forum and the Colosseum and the ancient ruins of Rome would be incorporated into the grandest garden in the world because instead of having fake ruins or fake follies in, in your picturesque garden, they would be the real ones. They would be actually the, the most important ancient 
ruins that that they knew of. Um, meanwhile, in Paris, there would be these triumph, the new triumphal carousel art, also later um, designs for the Arc de Triomphe as well, and all of it in terms of developing uh, a, a, a huge green space at the at the very centre of Paris. Um, my next image is of, as you see, a, a modest garden pavilion overlooking the River Seine. And the importance of this, I was talking about the imagined gardens uh, and, and the way in which they reflect Napoleon's grandeur and, and, and his um, ambitions. He was hoping after the birth of his son, who was known as, as the King of Rome, and he was hoping to construct a new enormous palace on the banks of the Seine. And in his mind, this was going to be superior to Versailles. And there were Percy and Fontaine, the architects I spoke of earlier, uh, who are very important in my book as the people sort of gathered around Napoleon onto whom he casts his shadow and he, he, he reflects, they reflect his dreams and they try to participate in making them, them come uh, true. But th they think that they are, they, they're very grand designs for this palace are going to actually rival um, Versailles. And the first stone for that palace was laid on um, the 15th of, of August, which was actually 1812, Napoleon's own birthday, but the same day as the attack on Smolensk, a walled city 360 kilometers southwest of Moscow. So despite the completely disastrous Russian campaign, back in Paris, Fontaine and Pessier, the architects, don't notice any slowing down of the plans for this new palace, not until the following year, at which point it becomes clear that Napoleon's power is threatened and declining, and the plans gradually reduce down to a smaller and smaller vision of what that palace can be until they are resolved into this garden pavilion, um, which, which you, you see here. Um, now, I'm moving now to, to talk about Waterloo. And um, I just, before I go into to any more detail, I want to say that as I was writing my book, um, at each stage of his life, I came upon um, a garden that I could use to be the frame for that particular stage and to use that frame to include other lives around his. But all the time I was doing that, I was worried about Waterloo. How would I tell the story of the final collapse of Napoleon's power um, through a garden? And when I came to that part in the book, it was completely magical for me to, to find that there was a walled garden at the centre of the Battle of Waterloo. It was the walled garden in the Chateau of Hougoumont, um, which was crucial uh, to, to, to the fight. Um, bef beforehand, both Napoleon and Wellington who had never actually faced each other on a battlefield before. Um, they both realized the importance of the chateau of Hougoumont. What you're seeing in this image is the walled garden. And I'll show you uh, here the chateau. And um, this is from after the battle where they're burying bodies in the left hand corner. But if we go back to the, um, the walled garden, um, you can see the, uh, the way in which there are um, trees and forest almost going right up to that garden. And that became hugely important um, 
in in the uh, unfolding of of the fight. So um, Wellington had decided that at all costs, the they must hold Hougoumont, um, hold those forces. The the forces must must hold the the fortifications. And as it turned out. Um, there had been a revolutionary battle on the exact same site, uh, the Battle of Fleurus um, in 94, which had really turned around the fortunes of the French Revolution. And when um, Wellington occupied this space, the loopholes through the wall that had been used in that successful battle from the French point of view were still there. So it's incredibly evocative that Napoleon um, and his, his power, which came out of the revolution, which would not have been possible without the revolution, ends up collapsing on the exact same site where the revolutionaries had had previously such a triumph. So in um, 1861, the novelist uh, Victor Hugo spent two months exploring the battlefield and the remains of Hougoumont. And he found that it had once again reverted to being a functioning farm. And he wandered around the garden and saw that originally it had been a formal garden in the French style. But by then it was full of brambles, full of gooseberry bushes. And he walked through the orchard counting 38 loopholes in, 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 in that garden wall enclosing it. And it seemed to him that on the one hand, it looked ready for renewed fighting. And yet the orchard was, as he put it, as susceptible to the month of May as any other. There were buttercups, daisies, high grass, cart horses, grazing, washing, hanging out to dry. And the, he noticed one sort of fragile apple tree that had been bandaged, almost like a wounded soldier with a poultice of straw and clay. Um, and he commented that nearly all the apple trees are decrepit with age. It's not one that doesn't have a bullet or whole and, and the skeletons of those dead trees were abounding within, within the orchard. Um, now I'm coming to uh, the, the final garden, um, which I described at the beginning of, of my talk briefly. Um, this is the garden on St. Helena, um, where, as I said, Napoleon had his most extensive period of actually personally gardening himself. Um, and also there is a huge poignancy in the idea of someone who had risen to such enormous heights, confined, constrained within this pretty hostile environment, although he put a lot of effort into making a garden, um, it was very, very difficult to, to, to do that. So um, what happened, uh, one of the things that inspired the gardening was that um, in September 1819, a new doctor arrived, sent by Napoleon's mother, um, an Italian physician, Francois Carlo Antomarchi, and he was the person who made the plaster cast of Napoleon's death mask that I began the talk with, with that powerful image of. And it was Antomarchi who urged Napoleon to resume exercise. Um, and Napoleon was reluctant to do so because he did not want to, the surveillance of the British guards. And so the doctor suggested, dig the ground, turn up the earth, escape from inactivity and the surveillance at the same time. And the reports are that Napoleon leapt upon this idea and basically galvanized his household into purchasing new gardening tools, elaborate plans were laid out. Um, here is uh, an image of of the bird cage that was constructed for him 
by Chinese workers who had been brought to the island of St. Helena by the East India Company and made this um, elaborate birdcage for, for Napoleon's garden. All the birds that were put into it died, um, but the birdcage was preserved. And when the loyal supporters of Napoleon went back to St. Helena, um, in 1840 to bring the remains of his body back to France, this birdcage was, was given to them and exists still in, in, in a museum in France. So we have uh, Napoleon right at the end of his life com confiding to one of his companions um, that the life he lived on St. Helena would have actually suited him very well if he hadn't been a captive. And he said, I should like to live in the country. I should like to see the soil improved by others for I do not know enough about gardening to improve it myself. But that kind of thing is the noblest existence. And at the end of his life, he believed man's true vocation is to cultivate the ground. Thank you very much. Okay, great, thank you. So we'll start taking questions from the audience. Uh, so the first question is, as you can imagine, there's probably more than I can count books written about Napoleon and his wonderful military career. Did you kind of have an aha moment saying, you know what, I should write about gardening? Um, okay, that's such an interesting question. I, I didn't, it's in two stages. So I had a kind of, not exactly an aha moment, um, but uh, you know what, I don't, I, there are other ways to write about Napoleon than to be endlessly going over these battles. Um, in military history, I'm, I'm not a military historian. It, I don't find it uh, riveting. Although I have to say when I was working on, on specific battles and uh, Waterloo in particular, I can completely see the attraction. But I personally wanted to write in a different way about Napoleon. But the gardening idea came later because that was, um, it, it grew out of the idea that I wanted to look at lives around his, but I needed a frame, you know, because there were multiple, how do you choose your cast? How do you look, you know? So I needed a framework and the image that was actually used for the cover of my book of Napoleon leaning on a spade, that had always really haunted me. And I just started to investigate why I was so interested in that image. And then the gardens kind of revealed themselves as I went through his life. So I wouldn't say it was an aha moment, but it was a kind of aha process, if you like, as I was going through the material. So you have the birdcage up there on the slide and we actually have a question from the audience. They're, they're wondering where's the museum in the world that has it, um, can you see it or is it kind of locked away? Well, at the moment it's locked away, but it is in a um, museum. It's the, it was given to Baron Gogo and it's in the museum, um, the, the family house that um, turned into a museum with the relics that had been given to the family and that they had collected. And they were so generous to me and so far as when I, I didn't know that this image existed. I, I found it in um, in a, an exhibition catalog, um, and I uh, wrote to them, um, and my publishers uh, needed to to get permission to to reuse the image. And they were so kind. They said, "You you can use it as long as you send us a copy of your book." So yes, you you. I mean, right right now. I think lots of these small museums are still closed, but in, in theory, absolutely you can see it. And, and, and it's such a powerful image of captivity um, and, and also beauty in captivity as, as well there. I mean, it's, it's this incredible elaborate work of art in, 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 in those really quite desperate circumstances. And sometimes you read about, you know, the circumstances in which he was in captivity are sort of rats everywhere. There's dampness, there's, you know, the, it's unhealthy, et cetera. And yet this was constructed for, for that last garden. And, and, and I found that very, very moving. Did Napoleon uh, encourage any of his uh, generals or marshals or even troops to take up uh, gardening? 
Oh, absolutely. So um, that also a very good question. So um, when he's assembling the troops um, uh, with a view to possibly invading England on, on the north of, of, of France, and they've got this big camp there, um, there are reports that um, these the soldiers were kind of getting quite restive and bored. And so um, one of the things that they started to do was to have like their allotments to grow food, et cetera. And he was always very interested in um, the soldiers basically having, having those skills to, uh, he didn't think that they, he was critical of the military training that basically was quite aristocratic and, um, you know, encouraged the soldiers to expect a certain kind of service, et cetera. That this was not, not, not sort of realistic, not practical, and that actually the soldiers should have those skills to, to, to grow food um, and to, to cultivate uh, grounds, et cetera. So that's one example. In the last garden, when he gets the whole household involved, it's actually kind of amusing because you know, their lives are quite hard enough without having to be digging the ground the whole time. So they get quite irritated um, by this, you know, enthusiasm that he has. And that they, they're like, oh, my goodness, you know, surely we're not going to have to dig yet another trench today, you know, etc. And then they sit down to um, to dinner and he likes to pretend that um, the food they're eating has all been grown, homegrown in the garden. I mean, I've talked to quite a lot of people about this. This is very common for people who grow their vegetables, et cetera, to, you know, take great pride in being able to, to consume them and, and maybe to exaggerate the extent to which they're self-sufficient. And that was definitely what was going on on St. Helena. Okay, we have a question about, um, let's see here. One of the paintings in your book, it says, uh, is it by accident you chose a painting by a Belgian artist when, of course, Waterloo figured so prominently in Napoleon's demise? Um, so, um, was it, which, which, which painting exactly are we referring to here? Let's see if I can find it here in the book. I got a copy yeah. of it here. So... It might be that one there. I'm thinking that's the one they're talking about. The, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, garden. yeah. Well, I mean, that's just, I think the reason I chose that one, I have it here, right? It's in my, uh, we can go back back to that. Um, here, this is the one. Is that right? Um, the reason I chose this uh, is, is the burying of the bodies here in the left-hand corner and the sort of parallel with the Tuileries Garden and the slaughter of the Swiss Guard there, where you've got the same sort of stark contrast, you've got the, this sort of horror or scene of, of these um, aftermath of the battle with these, the, the, these, these corpses now that have got to be disposed of in, in that way. So I think probably it's not so much nationalistic um, and, uh, you know, Belgium versus French or, 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 or anything like that. It's, it's more um, the universal horror of, of, of war and the way in which at the beginning and at the end of this trajectory in Napoleon's life, there are these two gardens that become battlegrounds. And that's the sort of symmetry that, that, that I was interested in there. Okay, uh, so we have a question about Egypt. Yeah, you talk about that in uh, your book. So uh, the audience member wants to know, can you elaborate on Napoleon's experience in Egypt uh, regarding, regarding guarding? <laughs> regarding guarding, yeah. So there's two basically. So he appropriates a palace for himself of uh, Asbaka uh, Square and he customizes that. It becomes known as the garden of the general in chief. Um, and it's also the garden in which after Napoleon basically does a runner from Egypt, leaving behind poor General Kleber to, to basically console these soldiers who were stranded there effectively, um, 
Kleber himself is murdered in that garden. So that was that was his sort of, Napoleon's sort of personal appropriation of of a garden and he he used to enjoy walking in it he had a mistress in Egypt that you know accompanying there etc um but then there is the institute garden and that's more of a public space and a scientific project and um he is very interested in um you know what's going on with the scientists he's got the soldiers guarding them when they go out on their scientific missions soldiers are really quite irritated about that first of all because they think possibly they're only in Egypt because of these scientists and their scientific interests and secondly they think it's a bit demeaning <clears throat> that they've gone all this way um, and they're ending up gardening you know people who are who are collecting plant and pond samples or whatever else they're doing they're just like you know what, what, what what's going on with that so those are the two main garden um focus for my Egypt chapter but there are also um urban planning dimensions um Napoleon in in all of the cities uh, where he's kind of always concerned to create green spaces he wants more avenues straighter constructed um, so whilst there's also there's a lot of planting going on there's also a lot of destruction going on that's the other thing I and mean, he doesn't hesitate to have trees cut down if he wants to have a straight road between his headquarters and the institute or or, or wherever um, another aspect which i didn't really uh, have have much space for in my book, but is is definitely related to the gardens. Is the uh, pushing out of the city, the centre of the city, the cemetery spaces, and then creating um, a sort of garden cemetery on the outskirts of the city. So that, that would be another aspect. I mean, that is particularly true um, in Venice, uh, and and certainly uh, he he talks about uh, the possibility in Rome as well and in Egypt this uh, this idea of somehow bringing urban planning in a way to make it more salubrious a sort of healthier um, center for, for the city. So does Napoleon's tomb in Paris, does, are there any references to gardening or plants in there that you know of? Uh, not in well no because that's a very military uh space where he's celebrated um there so um no i mean that that the, the tomb is it's very interesting the tomb um so during i um during the, the bicentenary celebrations as a french uh artist who wanted to hang um a skeleton of Marengo, the the, the horse, um, uh, supposedly Napoleon's sort of favoured fav favoured horse, uh, from and the skeleton is in the um, is is in the in the military museum, but they wanted to hang it above the tomb, and and, and they couldn't because it's too fragile. So they made a replica of it, hung it above the tomb, and this was considered by by many people to be almost kind of sacrilegious. You know, it was kind of really frivolous um, approach, and so I think similarly, you know, plants you know the natural world anything that you brought into that space would get a very similar response and I actually found the artist's idea really interesting um so you know I I, I wasn't at all I I thought it was powerful but I know that a lot of very serious uh you know passionately committed Napoleon uh fans were upset by it Okay, for our last question, can you talk a little bit about the research process and maybe anything cool that you found in the archives that maybe hasn't come to light before now? Um, yes. Uh, so, I mean, with my, with my research, um, I kind of see myself more as a portrait painter rather than the person who turns up, you know, the, the rare... Um, 
clue or or what we call um, green fingers in the archive. Actually, they to continue the gardening theme. Um, there are some some colleagues of mine who go into an archive and they can somehow put their finger on some kind of missing piece of a, of a document or, or something like that. That that is not the kind of um, approach that that I take. I'm more interested. I was in my book about Robespierre and and now in Napoleon, in really trying to encourage people to see things from uh, unexpected or unusual angles and to get over what I said at the beginning, the kind of the for and against debates. So I want to present um, a, a a fresh. Um, a multi-dimensioned picture of someone that allows people and one of the things I've been most pleased about is some people have read my book and they said they really enjoyed it but they can't tell if I like Napoleon or not and for me that's that's a real triumph because I'm not trying to tell people look you've got to get on board with hating him or you've got to get on board with loving him I just want them to see him and to think about him in in unusual ways so I would say that that was my contribution that's what I'm most proud of Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us. We know it's getting late over there in England as well past midnight, so we definitely we thank you for coming in and talking about your book tonight. Fantastic. Okay, okay. thank you. And thanks for everybody much. for joining us, and everybody take care. And thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good night. Bye.